name's Alan Simmons, I'm from NHS Careers. How many of you have heard of NHS Careers before? Excellent, I think that's the largest show of hands I've seen at a Careers Advice event, that's really good news. I've got quite a lot to pack in, if any of you have heard me present before, you know I tend to um, pack quite a lot in, and today's no exception. There is quite a lot to get through, so I hope you bear with me. Uh, there may not be time for questions here in the auditorium at the end, but please come and join me at the speaker's corner in the main <coughs> exhibition area, or find me on the NHS career stand a bit later on this afternoon. So these are the topics I plan to cover this afternoon. Um, it's a bit tricky. Uh, we've been asked to talk for 20 minutes and so on, but actually I've got a bit more than 20 minutes for us, but we should be out by three, fingers crossed three. So a bit about the NHS, uh, its size and its structure. Uh, there's a few workforce comparisons just coming up on the screen to give you a, a comparison of how the NHS fits in. Anybody know how many people work for the NHS? Somebody said a million. Somebody said quite a few. Um, <laughs> the answer is about 1.4 million. It's the fourth largest employer in the world currently, so we're told. It's the largest employer in Europe. Uh, if you want to know who the larger employers are, the latest information we have. Chinese Army, the Indian Railway, and as the Walmart. <laughs> so it's a big employer, and it's a pretty complex uh, setup. When we talk about the NHS, we tend to talk about one employer. In actual fact, it's currently made up of around about 315 separate organisations. And this is really important because if you're talking to students that you're working with about things like job hunting or work experience, for example, then each of those organisations is an employer in its own right. Each is responsible for its own recruitment. Each will have its own policy on work experience. <coughs> okay, that's really, really important. I say this is a situation at the moment. I've got a lovely slide later on which I'll show you if there's time, showing you how it looks, how it may look in the future. I say may because there's still quite a few uh, T's to cross and I's to dot and decisions to be made which are well out of my hands um, about the structure of the NHS in the future. But at the moment, primary care trusts and strategic health authorities, as far as we know, are going to be abolished next year. What impact will that have? We wait to see, but um, watch this space. How the NHS works? Well, we talk very much about primary care and secondary care. Primary care, the blue area towards the top of this graph, is where people go when they initially want contact with the, with the NHS, whether that's to the local GP, whether it's to the dental practice, whether it's to NHS Direct. And if having contacted somebody in the primary care sector, they need to be referred, they will go to somewhere in the <coughs> secondary care sector for treatment, tests, or whatever it may be. Put a couple of facts there on the right-hand side, which you uh, might have spotted. Um, the one I added most recently is the one at the bottom. Increase in the use of telehealth could affect 3 million patients. Telehealth, as some of you may know, um, is this idea whereby uh, for many routine appointments where uh, a patient perhaps needs to go to their local GP practice or into hospital for regular tests, some of these tests maybe can be done at the patient's own home. And the patient can administer the tests themselves. The results are then downloaded to the telephone line back to the local health centre where they can be analysed. And some of this work has already been piloted in areas like the Lake District um, and one or two other parts of the country. And we may well see an increase in this type of uh, provision of healthcare. <coughs> so this could affect three million patients. We don't know for certain, but these are things to sort of bear in mind. And the nature of healthcare is moving very much more towards a community-based um, system. Okay, so we've got this 1.4 million of staff who work in the NHS, and what I'm going to present to you now is a, a pie chart. Um, hopefully the graphics will be sub substantially bigger than what they sometimes are when I show this slide, so you can see what the percentages are. So doctors and dentists make up around about 10% of the NHS workforce. And then we can add uh, nurses, midwives, and health visitors uh, to that, and we add another 20%, sorry, 30%. So we end up, so far, with a workforce of 40%. So who else works in this NHS <coughs> organisation? Well, around about 5% of the workforce are healthcare scientists. 
and we'll talk a bit more about healthcare science in a few moments. A similar proportion of staff are employed as allied health professionals. These are physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, dietitians, podiatrists, um, and a whole host of others. <coughs> and they make up, as I say, around about 5%. Qualified ambulance staff, and here I'm talking about people with a professional, usually paramedic, qualification, make up around about 1%. And <coughs> then we have managers and senior managers, which currently make up around about 3%. And yes, you did read that correctly. That says hotel, property and estate. Hotel, property and estate in the NHS. You've got to be kidding, right? Well, actually, if you think about it, the NHS has an infrastructure which includes many hospital buildings, many clinics, um, and other buildings and structure. And <coughs> those buildings need to be maintained, they need to be designed, they need to be built. Uh, we need to provide catering, we need to provide cleaning staff, and so the list goes on. So we've actually got a similar number of people working in that sector as we have of healthcare scientists. It's quite interesting when you see it in a chart to actually um, be able to compare different sectors that we work for. Health informatics includes people who manage information, whether they're statisticians, <coughs> librarians, uh, we employ people doing data input, input work, um, clinical coders. We also employ people um, who are involved in uh, making sure that information is analysed correctly and presented in terms of league tables and so on. Uh, we know that the NHS is always being uh, assessed on its performance, how do you manage that assessment? Well, it's down to other people working in health informatics. And it also, this group also includes people who look after all the IT system and telephony system. Like any organisation, there will be central functions like human resources, finance, communications and so on. And then we have a number of staff working in support roles, making up around about 30%. And this will include therapy support workers, healthcare assistants, um, some of the administrative staff that we employ in the NHS. So when you look at that 1.4 million, and this is just England, excluding Scotland and Wales, the variety of roles, I'm sure you'd agree, is actually very, very broad. <coughs> I'm sure some of you, many of you, watch these programmes, uh, as I do from time to time. But the key message, it's not just doctors and nurses. And if you've heard me present before, you know I've got this slide usually coming up somewhere. Um, this is a real, uh, really important message that we're trying to get out constantly from NHS careers. A lot of people think that the NHS is just doctors and nurses, and a lot of their perceptions, understandably, are based on either personal experience or what they watch on the telly. So we're there to try and dispel some of those myths, and we welcome your support. We value the help that you can give us with that. So how do you make sense of those 350 careers, actually, that are, exist in the NHS? Well, we've broken them down at NHS careers into 10 career areas, 10 modules, if you like. <coughs> Starting from the top, healthcare science, management, the wider healthcare team, the allied health professions, nursing, and then medicine, midwifery, dental care, the ambulance service, and careers in health informatics. And we have publications on all of those. In fact, as you may uh, have guessed, these are actually screenshots from publications that we produce. I'm going to highlight information affecting <coughs> these three particular career areas today. I haven't got time in 20 minutes to go into all the detail about everything that's going on in the NHS. I think I'll be here for a, a bit longer than a half an hour slot. Um, <coughs> so I hope you'll bear with me, and uh, we'll, we'll just go through some of these. So. To work. I want to start with healthcare science. Healthcare science incorporates a variety of roles, and they're not all your textbook, white lab coat based roles. <coughs> the list in the life sciences uh, column, yes, predominantly are going to be staff working in the laboratory setting, um, where they're assessing, they're diagnosing, and they're looking at. Um, blood samples, urine samples, tissue samples, whatever. <coughs> With the exception of phlebotomy, which as many of you will probably know is about taking blood from a patient, 
with the exception of lobotomy, they tend to be laboratory based. There's not a lot of direct patient contact. If you compare that with the list on the left, the physiological sciences, those demand a lot of direct patient contact because you're going to be measuring the patient's gastrointestinal tract if you like physiology, or how their heart is working if I like physiology, and so on. So you can't do those remotely. What's the happening there? And on the right hand side we have physical sciences and biomedical <coughs> engineering, which is around um, calibrating equipment that's giving uh, dosages um, in radiotherapy, for example, or maybe designing new equipment, and so on. Now, in terms of uh, what's affecting careers in healthcare science, there's this initiative called Modernising Scientific Careers. <coughs> and this slide, which has come from a document you can get from the Department of Health website, shows you what modernising scientific careers is aiming to do. I'm not going to explain it all in great detail, but I want to highlight some of the main changes. And first of all, let's just have a look at what modernising scientific careers is. Where's my house today? <coughs> the idea behind modernising scientific careers is to streamline the routes into and career development through healthcare science opportunities. <coughs> and there are a number of new routes that are being developed and are already in place um, with more to come. So let's just look at those in a bit more depth. There's the Pract Practitioner Training Programme, the PTP. And what this is, is a suite of new BSc healthcare science degrees some of which are already available um, <coughs> at a number of universities across England. And these are uh, an opportunity for somebody to come in with A-levels or an equivalent level of qualification. And at the end of that, that training, they can go on and either go into the scientist training programme on the right, or come straight into employment as a healthcare scientist practitioner. So what sort of opportunities are available under uh, PTP? So these are the three broad science areas that we looked on on the previous slide, broken down in a bit more detail. So to give you an idea of where these courses are on offer, Wolverhampton and Anglia Ruskin are all offering those two opportunities. Audiology is being offered by Southampton. <coughs> the life sciences are being offered, these are just examples, at Plymouth and the University of the West of England. And Bradford and Westminster are also offering genetics technology. <coughs> And these courses are already running, or will be starting for the first time this coming September. De Montfort is also running uh, some of the <coughs> medical physics related courses there. So you do a BSc in healthcare science, <coughs> and um, in brackets, if you like, at the end, you will do the specialist area, the specialism that's mentioned there. These courses actually um, they are not attracting NHS financial support but they do have around about, or up to, 50 weeks of work experience in the NHS, in laboratory settings or working alongside healthcare scientists in other settings. The Scientist Training Programme, or STP, has replaced what any of you may have known previously <coughs> as the Clinical Scientist <coughs> Training Programme. This is a graduate entry programme, so if you have a relevant degree in science, or engineering, then you can apply for one of the STP posts. Now, 206 trainee vacancies have been advertised for this year's intake. Uh, the applications opened a week ago today, and I can tell you so far they've received 5,234 <coughs> applicants. The closing date is Monday, next week. So you can see it's pretty competitive. Um, I don't know how many of those will meet the criteria to get through to the next stage, um, but it is a new route in. It, the first time it was uh, offered was last year. Slightly different arrangements in Wales and Scotland, but in terms of England, that's the number of vacancies um, that have been advertised so far. Okay, let's <coughs> get the mouse to work again. Sorry about this, my mouse is... Um, <coughs> In terms of management, that's not where I wanted to go, right? Let's try and 
everything then. Oh, I thought I left the guy there. Okay. Best way of planning for all that. Let's go. All I was going to say about management basically was that there's a reduction in management being proposed. In terms of the number of management posts in the NHS, there are uh, targets to reduce the number of management opportunities. Having said that, the NHS will continue to recruit. Uh, we also run a graduate management training programme, which I'll come on to in a moment. And that is recruiting. There are no plans to see that particular route stopping, for example. The other area I want to touch on briefly was nursing. I think I know what's taking away. No idea why that's taking me there. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> just bear with me while I just go through these slides. Right, nursing there we are. <coughs> As many of you will probably know, nursing will become a degree only entry from next September 2013. The number of HCIs offering uh, diploma programmes, tip HE programmes, has gone down by approximately 60%. That's our sort of estimate from the previous year. The the text that's highlighted in the middle column there, as you will probably recognise, is uh, relates to the degree, sorry, the branch of nursing that you must specialise in when you first train at university. So you have to choose general adult, learning disability, mental health, or paediatric children's nursing. And you normally select one of those. However, as you'll see from the electronic post-it now on the left, Southampton <coughs> University has broken the mould and is now offering a couple of joint branch courses. These are brand new um, <coughs> and you'll see they're offering adult and child health and adult and mental health. I've never come across these degree courses being offered before so they are brand new. They're four year courses rather than the traditional three years in length. Other universities may follow this trend. I've heard uh, an inkling that Oxford Brooks may be offering some of these sorts of courses in the future. Um, as far as I know they will attract NHS financial support uh, like the existing courses do. Okay, let's move on to looking at opportunities at university and beyond. <coughs> there are a number of courses which are clinically related which you can do at university if you come into the NHS. You'll see that there are a number there with an asterisk next to them, a single asterisk. These are courses which attract NHS financial support which changed slightly last summer, and the arrangements are just briefly summarised at the bottom there. So if you're doing a course, um, an eligible student doing one of the courses with a single asterisk next to them, you'll get your tuition fees paid in full by the NHS, you don't need to pay them back, you get a £1,000 grant which you don't need to pay back, and a means-tested bursary. <coughs> if you're going for a course with two asterisks, which is medicine and dentistry in this list, then the NHS financial support kicks in in your final year only, year five, if you're doing a standard five-year course. If you want more information, go on to the NHS student bursaries website at the bottom. That is the place to go to get information about student bursaries in the NHS. Uh, one of the things on that website is a calculator where you can estimate how much financial support you might get. Okay, in terms <coughs> of changes, I've mentioned the healthcare science courses that are being offered. <coughs> um, and there are changes going on there, as you see. In terms of graduate entry, I've mentioned the STP, the Scientist Training Programme. Uh, there's also been a discussion going on around biomedical scientists. Um, if you want to talk about biomedical scientists and you're interested in that particular career route for students you're working with, then come and have a chat with me afterwards. That's probably the best way of uh, explaining that to you. Suffice to say that there, it looks like there will be a decreasing number of trainee biomedical scientist posts in the future, and students therefore on biomedical science courses at the moment are probably going to need to be encouraged to look at the STP route, the Scientist Training Programme route, that we talked about earlier. As you'll see, the NHS also employs um, people with degrees who've had appropriate training in arts therapies, um, <coughs> in areas of psychology, and there are a number of accelerated or shortened programmes for graduates where they can get accreditation for their previous degree and end up doing, for example, uh, a degree in medicine in four years rather than five. 
or a nursing program in two years rather than three. The other point I should mention about medicine, um, <coughs> you may have heard me say this before, if you've heard me speak, um, a number of medical schools offer four-year accelerated programs for graduates. Some will require your first degree to be an irrelevant requirement. <coughs> Some do not mind what degree your what degree discipline your degree is in. So you could have a degree in history and go on to be a doctor. Okay. Um, it's a bit different for dentistry. The four-year courses tend to want a relevant science first degree to get you on to specialist course. Again, financial support is available from the NHS around a similar arrangement on the previous slide. <coughs> in addition to um, the clinical uh, opportunities, there are also a number of non-clinical areas. The graduate management scheme has been running for many years in the NHS. Um, this year it's taken on 150 plus uh, trainees, and you'll see it has 12,000 applicants. <coughs> Last year it had 150 places and had 15,000 so I'm not sure quite what that trend is telling us, um, but you can get an idea of the competition that there is. <coughs> we also take people into uh, other areas such as health informatics and engineering and so on. So there are lots of opportunities within the NHS. It's estimated that around about 50% of the NHS workforce have a degree or professional qualification, which therefore means that 50% don't. Um, <coughs> and there is a career framework which I'll briefly want to mention to you. This has been developed by Skills for Health, the Sector Skills Council for the healthcare <coughs> sector. There are nine uh, areas, or nine levels, if you like, to the career framework, and you might be wondering why Bob Holness has suddenly appeared on my screen. Um, for those of you, like me, who are a little bit older, um, Bob Holness used to present this program on TV called Blockbusters. And if you're familiar with Blockbusters, the next couple of slides make make more sense to you. The idea behind the career framework is that you have, does it ring any bells? Um, you'll see the nine bands on the left hand side, along the top the different career modules that I've mentioned earlier. And I've just populated those with some job titles. The idea behind the career framework is that you don't always have to progress straight up. You might go straight up and work your way upwards, or you might start <coughs> at one level and move to a different area. <coughs> or you might go right across and change and then work your way up and then go in a completely different direction again. So the idea is to have flexibility, offer flexibility, and recognise that not everybody necessarily wants to just progress straight up. They want to perhaps change direction and work in another area. Um, it's a bit like snakes and ladders, isn't it? Okay, pay. Let's just touch on pay very briefly. The NHS has three pay systems in effect. It has a gender for change, which covers the vast majority of staff. A gender for change has nine bands, nine levels, which run from band one, which is just under 14,000 a year, to band nine, the top of which is just under 98,000 a year. A newly qualified nurse, physio, midwife, excuse me, radiographer, would start <coughs> at the bottom of band five, and that's the current salary of 21,976. There are also London allowances which would be paid on top of those figures that I've quoted. Doctors and dentists are on a separate pay system, which is incredibly complicated. Uh, the last one I saw around about 25 pages, um, and quite difficult to get your head around. Uh, and there's also a separate pay system for very senior managers. A pay freeze um, was imposed on salaries above 21,000 uh, last year, and my understanding is that that will last two years in total. Okay, <coughs> I just want to spend just a few moments on um, careers and information and resources that we provide. We are a service for England only. You may be familiar with everything I'm going to show you. You may be familiar with some or none of what I'm going to show you, but hopefully you'll still find it of interest. We have four websites. We have a range of literature. We have a contact centre in Bristol, which is where I'm based. <coughs> we can also tell people about job vacancies through the jobs website. We don't provide careers counselling and guidance. We're not resourced to do that. There is separate provision in Scotland and in Wales. Our contact details are coming up on the screen. Don't try and write them all down. Uh, if you want to know the contact details, come and visit us on our stand. We've got a very helpful little leaflet which has got all our contact details on it. 
And just to highlight a couple of things, you can see towards the bottom there, we have a Facebook channel, Facebook page, that's aimed at young people. We have a YouTube channel, all sorts of video content on there, some of which may interest you. And we also have a Twitter feed. And some of you I know are following NHS careers on Twitter, or perhaps following me on my Twitter <coughs> uh, account as well. The Facebook channel, I looked earlier this week, it's got just around about five and a half thousand people who like the NHS careers Facebook channel. That probably means something. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm not particularly uh, good with Facebook. But um, we, we get a lot of interest from young people um, who ask questions, post questions about careers. It's also a good way of us being able to promote some of the activities that we've been involved with. And we have a face, uh, sorry, YouTube channel on the right-hand side there. Um, a career as a dietitian was added last month. Careers in art therapy was added last month. So there may be video content that would be useful to you in sessions that you're running. When it comes to the literature we produce, we have around about 60 different bits of literature. We have a new booklet um, which is about health visiting. The NHS is looking to recruit 4,200 additional health visitors by 2015. There's a big programme of work on around that at the moment. Um, again, if you want to know more, come and talk to us on the stand or have a talk with me at the um, speaker's corner later on. Now, there's a couple of things about the literature just to mention. At the bottom, we have a number of fact sheets, around about 60 fact sheets in total. Those are still available in hard copy, but once we run out of hard copy, they will only be available as download. Um, the booklets, we, are, will, we aim to continue to produce those in hard copy format, and organisations such as the ones that you work for are very welcome to call us and order stocks for your own supplies. We no longer sell them to individual uh, people. We just don't have the resources, the cost. We just can't afford to do it anymore, basically. So you can download everything from our main website, but there's a whole raft of information that you might find of use. Our main website uh, has got around about 1,500 pages. A lot of information on there. Um, <coughs> the one thing I wanted to just touch on very briefly is this thing on the right called our course finder. No prizes for guessing what that does. Um, but let me just explain why we've got a course finder. If you want to work in the NHS in a clinical role, many, many clinical roles require you to be registered with the professional regulating body. And <coughs> these are they, and these are the professions that they cover. So, for example, if you want to work as a paramedic, you must be registered with the HPC. If you want to work as a pharmacist, you must be reg registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council. How do you get registration? You get registration by meeting the requirements of that regulatory body. And in most cases, that means uh, successfully achieving um, a course that they have approved. You can see where this is going, can't you? When you've gone to UCAS, you might think that the course titles are pretty obvious, but they're not always. So, for example, if you're looking at a course in speech and language therapy, how do you know which course is actually a lead to registration? You can tell that from the UCAS site, and obviously the UCAS site has a different function from our site. Similarly, if you look at dental hygiene and dental therapy, oral health sciences, would you automatically think to look there? <coughs> so, <coughs> if you go on the UCAS website, just to sort of reinforce this a little bit, we're looking at speech and language therapy, which course do you look at? Do you look at speech? Do you look at speech therapy? Do you look at something else? You get a list of courses, but how do you know which ones lead to registration? The short answer is you can't tell purely from the UCAS website. If you go onto our website, our course finder has a drop down list of courses, only courses that lead to registration. And <coughs> finding courses in speech and language therapy, if you look at the course titles, speech and language therapy, top one, middle one, clinical language sciences, and the one at the bottom, human communication. That's why we've built the course finder, specifically to help people find the information they need quickly. <coughs> Obviously, they still need to apply through UCAS and so on and so on. Our second website is our Step Up the NHS programme. This contains a lot of information aimed at the 14 to 19 year old uh, year group. Um, <coughs> and young people are encouraged to register with the site. It's free to register. And by registering with the site, they can actually uh, get access to additional areas of the website and get ongoing email communication from us until they're 19. That's e outgoing email communication that we send to them three times a year. Our third website is our undergraduate website, What Can I Do With My Degree? This actually isn't a home page. There's a page before this where you put in your degree subject and it will then come up with a, s a screen similar to this one 
that you see in front of you, it will give you some suggestions of careers based on your degree discipline. Our third website, third or fourth, fourth, is our Nursing Careers microsite, specifically developed to <coughs> dispel some of the myths around nursing. And as we move towards a degree entry um, profession, we wanted to have the opportunity to provide much more detailed information about the profession. So there are video clips, there are resources that can be downloaded, uh, all sorts of useful information on the site. Okay, just bear with me while I try and get my mouse back again. Okay. NHS Jobs website. Um, if you're looking for a job, or you work with students looking for jobs, NHS Jobs website is where all of the NHS organisations in England and Wales advertise their vacancies. Various uh, elements of the site which I won't bore you with in detail, but the main point that I want to make about this is this bit here. This more advanced <coughs> search facility. It's hidden underneath the, the quick search box. Why am I mentioning this to you? Well, <coughs> if you're working in the careers field, you will be picking up information about people's skills, among others. And if you take the advanced search, there is a search by skills field. So you can search for vacancies based on the skills field. Why would you want to do that? Well, it might help you find some of those jobs that have titles that you've never heard of before. That's exactly why I use it anyway. Um, let me give you some examples. <coughs> if you're looking for vacancies related to nutrition, use the advanced search, try some of those terms, and you get job titles like this coming up. Now, you wouldn't necessarily automatically have thought, right, I'm going to look for vacancies as a lifestyle support worker. Do you, have, do you see what I mean? And I'll give you some other examples just to sort of throw them up on the screen. So it's trying to think broadly. I was talking to, to a colleague earlier um, who works in a university asking about psychology related job vacancies. And um, what, what, she, what we were saying was that if you use this way of searching for vacancies, you will find lots of opportunities that you may never have thought of before. Okay, this is the slide I wanted to show you. Now take this all down, make sure you know it <laughs> inside out. This is the way the NHS is likely to work in the future, look like in the future, we think. But we haven't had it confirmed yet. So, <laughs> I'm not going to even try and describe that, explain that slide to you. Um, if you want to visit the slide for yourself, it's come from uh, the South East um, NHS. Really useful slide, uh, but a bit challenging to understand. Now there's a nice simpler one, that's on the BBC website. Um, doesn't actually encapsulate everything, but it's a really useful one. Okay. I've got any questions up there, but I've just been given that sort of sing signal, which I think means you've got to wind it up and get <laughs> off the stage. So um, I'm going to be back at Speaker's Corner in a few minutes, or come and see us on the stand. We're actually on stand number six, um, just next to the fire door, on the right as you go in. There are a number of other stalls which you might have to go and visit, which are related <coughs> either clinically or university-wide or professional body -wise. So thank you all for attending and for standing up.